I never knew, I didn't have a clue what Kaylin was going to talk about, but as I threw together a few images, I threw in this one, which is my VUCA <laughs> slide, um, because uh, I, uh, Kaylin thankfully gave you the whole background for this term coming out of the military. I learned it from a futurist named Bob Johansson, who's written a very important book, I think, called Le Leaders Make the Future, 10 Leadership Skills for an Uncertain World. And uh, he, in, in, I don't, this is not one of his slides, someone else developed this slide, but uh, what, one of the things that are suggested if you are in this volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous world, which I submit that we are, uh, that you can hope to develop skills in vision, understanding, clarity, and agility to counter the sort of more scary VUCA words with things that are more um, generative and can hopefully lead to more positive outcomes. The last skill that Bob Johansson identifies in those 10 skills is called commons creating. And just as Mimi talked about connected, connected learning pathways, commons creating according to uh, uh, Bob Johansson is the most important leadership skill for the future. It's not easy, but it's, it's very important. And his latest book, which he just wrote, is called The Reciprocity Advantage where he basically posits that this kind of taking commons creating, and he's writing for for profits. He's, he doesn't really talk much about nonprofits, but that this latest, that creating reci reciprocal relationships which are beyond transactional and different from philanthropic relationships, they sit in a kind of mid place in that continuum, uh, is really the business strategy for the future, so. Um, another influence on me and my thinking about learning, uh, and I have to say, I have to thank also some of the folks at the MacArthur Foundation um, for bringing me closer to John C. Lee Brown's work. Any of you know John C. Lee Brown? Suzanne does. Um, very much. He, he, John C. Lee Brown is one of the kitchen cabinet with Henry Jenkins and Mimi Ito and a number of other researchers who have been really kind of their patron saints and the, and the foremothers and forefathers for the whole connected learning work. And he gave a wonderful keynote uh, about three years ago at the Association of Children's Museums meeting that you can, um, that you can find online. And he basically says that what new, he's, he was the director of research, I think, at Xerox Park. He's been a great supporter of, new, of the power, the changing power of new technologies in the world that we're in. And he's, he's very entertaining. In this talk, he basically says that the new digital domains in which we operate basically are letting us take the teachings of John Dewey and, and Maria Montessori whom I, I'm sure that all of you value for as guideposts in your museum education work. But we kind of, can, they can be achieved now in scales and dimensions that neither Maria Montessori nor John Dewey ever could have imagined. So all of you who have expertise and work with directors who have expertise and curators who have expertise, what John C. Lee Brown is suggesting, and again, I can't do him justice in my two minutes on this slide, is that we have to move from a stocks model to a flows model, and that is a social model of learning. It is a participatory model of learning. In one of his talks, he shows a picture of a two-year-old with an iPhone and said, this is the researcher of the future. So again, he's saying, with the explosion of new knowledge, any kind of received or given knowledge has a much more limited shelf life. So I'll leave it there and hope that that generates some good conversation. So um, I, you know, I like consider myself a bumblebee because I'm able to buzz into different places. And one of the places that I've had a chance to buzz lately is some work 
an organization that was established by the Center for Creative Leadership, which is based in North Carolina, but actually has a worldwide presence. And one of the guys I got to meet through CCL is a fellow named Chris Ernest, who's just written a book a couple of years ago based on extensive research. This is research in the corporate domain. You know, and what I heard this morning from so many of you, I heard triumph and pain. <laughs> you know, inspiration and agony. And what's so interesting, and that, and that, you know, your institutions, your museums are being driven to be more and more like businesses. Well, I'm here to tell you that more and more businesses are cultivating the kinds of skills that we in museums have. They're hungry for them. So what, in the research project that led to this book called Boundary Spanning Leadership, uh, again, like the VUCA world, what Chris and Donna Chabro Mason, his partner in, in research, discovered, and this is a global research study, with only corporations, right? There may be a couple of social service organizations, that the most important challenges we face are interdependent and require boundary-spanning leadership skills in order to solve them. And that the key elements in working on these challenges are relational and psychological. How many times this morning did I hear soft, soft skills, soft, and bemoaning the fact that we're labeled as portrayers or perpetrators of soft skills? Well, they're saying these soft skills are the essential leadership skills we need to move from issues of us and them to we. And it's a wonderful way they describe boundaries because they describe boundaries as ways that limit us and silos, we talked about silos this morning, providing limits and boundaries for what we do so they enclose. But another definition for boundary is that they can define a frontier, the location of the most advanced or newest activity in an area. And they go through this book and talk about, I think, uh, five different kinds of boundaries. And we've talked about all of them today. Vertical boundaries in an organization chart, right, from the CEO to a lower level. Horizontal boundaries, the development office versus the marketing office versus the education office. Stakeholder boundaries, those audiences and customers that we serve. Demographic boundaries, and in this construction of demo demographics, that was really uh, referring more to coalitions that go across geographic areas, whether global partnerships, kind of thing Kaylin was talking about, or other, um, where a company might have a number of branches. And then geographic, oh, I'm sorry, demographic is not that. Geographic is that geographic thing. Demographic is really looking at generational differences, age differences, all those different kinds of diversities within our organizations and within our communities. So again, I'm not doing anybody justice, but one of their, the, the book discusses a set of leadership activities and attributes that can help you move from that we versus them to, and the managing boundaries piece, which is a very important piece to discovering new frontiers. Buffering, reflecting, connecting, mobilizing, weaving, and transforming. I think the word identity also came up a lot today, and one of the key elements of this book is that we all have multiple identities. We have and they're based on our interests, they're based on our personal lives. Well, we have individual identities, we have group identities and affiliations, and we have organizational identities and affiliations. And to manage between and among those different types of identities to create a we, to create a we from the us and them is very, very, very challenging work. And so I just recommend this to you because there's some wonderfully very specific um, tools and questions that Chris and Donna raise. So 
again, this is all sort of variations on the same theme. A lot of has been written, I've been following a lot of work in collective impact, and I'll show you a slide of it. So collective impact is a, are any of you involved in collective impact projects? Have any of you heard of collective impact? Okay, so it's mostly gotten its play in the Stanford Social Innovation Review, but again, the notion is we have these hard, technical, wicked problems that, that we have to solve that can only be solved by um, different kinds of adaptive leadership so solutions. They don't have a, a playbook. You know, if you want to know how to bake a cake, that's a, that's a technical problem, right? Even if you want to launch a rocket, that's a complex problem, it's complicated, but it's not a wicked problem, right? You know, once somebody did it, you can do it again. You know, it's a long, it's a, it's much longer instruction manual and recipe book. But what Collective Impact is saying that we have some wicked problems that are facing us as a society. And I would argue that effective learning is one of those challenging problems. So what Collective Impact is about is having organizations that each have our own legitimate, valuable, cherished missions, and they're, they're good missions, we do good in the world, but too often we're not aligning the work of our different organizations to ac achieve some systemic impact. And in this work, there have been many foundations who basically said our investments as we invest in museum by museum by museum, library by, by library, United Way chapter by United Way chapter, we're getting all these wonderful sort of individual results and individual programmatic evaluations. But we have, but if you look at the meta statistics about poverty or learning or income inequality or climate change or whatever, we really haven't moved the needle. So let's come up with some new formats. And I don't have a slide with all the different aspects of collective impact, but it's something that you might look into. And basically, coming out of that are some new um, thoughts about system leadership, which instead of only thinking about the needs of your institution, and of course, this is a this is an, involves not only a CEO of an institution, but it also involves boards. Um, there's a profound commitment to the health of the whole, that you're working to contextualize your organizational self-interest in the interests of a larger system and a larger problem. Uh, you spend a lot of time in sessions like this where you're reflecting on what you've been doing and you're generating new ideas and new solutions, and some of them probably have never been thought of before because they're coming out of the collective wisdom. And it's thinking again, instead of looking back, you're looking forward. So I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna go, I think you all have this, so I'm not gonna get into this. I was asked um, by Greg Stevens at AAM to do a short piece in Museum News, and it's in the I saw, so I'm not gonna get into it at all. And, and Nathan Ritchie was a great addition to our team. We had a small group of faculty working in a two different settings, one a set of online, web, uh, online webinars, but also some on-site um, gatherings at AAM for some of the Getty Fellows and some other AAM Fellows uh, talking about these leadership skills and just think about what we spent a huge amount of time on were actually things that the Noyce Leadership Institute, which I've been associated with for the last two years, advocates. And Sherry Werb is here as one of our Noyce alums. Sherry, I can't see you. Where are you? There you are. I think you're the only, is anybody else an NLI alum here? It's more focused in the science area, but, um, and we have, I think, a 123 alumni, but these were people like Sherry, leadership, people playing leadership roles in their respective institutions, mostly around science and, um, and from around the world. And they each came with a strategic initiative which was really designed to make a bigger impact 
in their community. And what we all learned about, and I was, believe me, I learned as much as I gave in that as I try to do wherever I am, but was it, um, as the, I guess the three big legs of the NLI stool are one, self-awareness. Everybody does, and NLI does a deep dive into who you are as a leader. And that includes Myers-Briggs assessment and a FIRO B, another kind of assessment, and a pretty intensive 360 assessment. Everybody gets a coach to help them think about really, really learning more about yourself as a leader because I don't think you can be an effective systems leader without knowing something about your own leadership strengths and where you need to surround yourself with people who complement your strengths. We talked a lot about that at our table this morning on leadership, and you can't do it all. So self-awareness, and then the other big piece of it, I, 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 this is great, is um, this notion of adaptive leadership. That if you're really going to make a difference in your organization and your community, you've really got to think about a, a different set of, of leadership skills, which are way opposite this command and control model. It's really about leader as learner. It's about leader managing wherever you sit in your organization. Productive and constructive sort of tension around collectively solving certain problems. I'm not giving this enough um, attention, but um, it's, it's a really interesting approach, and I would urge you to think about adaptive leadership. It's about being up on the balcony, but it's about constantly mining and strengthening whole manner of communications channels within your organization because you can never communicate enough. And what we all know is we all speak our own jargon. So we think we're being absolutely clear, but the person in the next cubby hole in the next office has his or her own way of describing his or her own place in the organization. And our, wor our words may not be meshing, even though our intentions may be aligned or certainly complementary. So I'm gonna keep going, oh, I've gotta go through this. So just a couple words about some system approaches and collective approaches that I've been following. Uh, this is an infographic that was created by KnowledgeWorks. Anybody here part of KnowledgeWorks? Yes, yeah, Cindy. So KnowledgeWorks is a nonprofit based in um, Cincinnati, Ohio. And they've worked with the Institute for the Future on a whole series of learning forecasts. And just as Mimi Ito talked about, this is, I use this diagram usually with the connected learning diagram, um, that we're currently in an extraordinarily fragmented learning ecosystem world. And, what, and it may continue to be that way. Mimi talked about her concerns, which I share, about growing inequity in people's access, in learners' access to the pathways that many of us know because we're privileged enough to know these pathways, but others don't. So this is an interesting, uh, you can go to the KnowledgeWorks website and you can learn more about this infographic. AM actually has published a piece on learning ecosystems that Beth Merritt and Paula Gangiopatier from the Henry Ford Museum uh, helped uh, shape. So all I can tell you is I'm on the side of the learning ecosystem and I understand how Herculean an effort it will be.